Good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio this year. I uh, wanted to welcome everybody to today's program, Lightness and Other Infrastructures, presented by Lori Hawkinson of Smith, Miller, and Hawkinson Architects. Before we start today's program, I would like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlighted on the screen now. Um, tonight, I'd like to give a special thank you to our AI Ohio firm sponsors. If you're a partner in one of our sponsoring firms, thank you for your support. If you work for one of the sponsoring firms, please let your firm leadership know that you appreciate their, the support of AI Ohio and the quality programming we're able to have this year due to their investment. If your firm's not part of our sponsor list, please consider joining your colleagues in support of our professional organization. I'd also like to thank all those who made donations to the AI Ohio Foundation as part of the registration process for the lecture series. Um, as you can see, I think Kate's gonna have a screen here on the screen for us, switch the slide. Um, the foundation has made significant investments in scholarships to architecture students in Ohio and the AIES chapters across the state. Over the last 10 years, we have some numbers. If you missed the opportunity to donate to the foundation during registration, please consider going to AI Ohio's website to show your support for the future of our profession. I've got uh, just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours, including about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. At the end of the program, we'll be looking to the chat box to identify participants who would like to ask their question. A uh, link will be placed in the chat box towards the end of the presentation. You can follow the link, enter your information and member number so that you can receive learning units for today's programs. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Mashke for selecting the speakers and moderating the design series for AI Ohio this year. Robert's a past president of AI Ohio the recipient of many awards, including the AI Ohio Gold Medal, the Cleveland Arts Prize for Design, the AI Ohio Gold Medal Firm, and national honors from the American Institute of Architects. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Robert to introduce our design speaker for this evening's program. Robert. Thank you, Karen. Um, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lori Hawkinson. She's a founding partner of New York City-based Smith Miller Hawkinson Architects, focusing on work in the public realm and committed to equity and service to the public. The office's projects vary in scale from temporary public art projects, the Freedom of Expression National Monument, to buildings and large scale master plans, such as the Strategic Open Space Study for Lower Manhattan. Built projects include a new ferry terminal at Pier 11 on Wall Street, the Dillon, an 87-unit residential project in Manhattan, and the Corning Museum of Glass. Lori is also a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation and serves as a commissioner for New York City's Public Design Commission, whose mission is to advocate for the innovative, sustainable and equitable design of public spaces and civic structures with the goal of improving the public realm and related services for all New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs. She holds an undergraduate and master's degree in fine arts from the University of California at Berkeley and, reserved, and received her professional degree in architecture from the Cooper Union where she is a recipient of the John Q. Haydick Distinguished Alumni Award. She is a member of the Contemporary Arts Council at the Museum of Modern Art and a founding member of the Board of Directors at the Wooster Group. Please welcome Lori Hawkinson. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, thank you to the AAO Ohio and to Karen and to uh, Kate who have been helping organize all of this and Karen for her introduction. Um, so I would like to share a number of different projects today of varying scales and then uh, for the program today and uh, we'll get into the title as we go forward. So I, I, the title lightness and other infrastructures, I, this word lightness I chose um, 
and it's really from this, this is a note from Calvino, Italo Calvino. Lightness is from a series of lectures written by Calvino, and the memos are lectures on the values of literature that Calvino felt were important for the coming millennium, so for the next millennium, right? So the term lightness varies in how it's used, but it's differenti differentiated from actual physical weight. So I wanna kind of highlight that, such as the lightness of balsa wood. So it's, it's differentiated from that. So in other words, he means light like a bird um, and not like a feather. So light like a bird. So lightness is also considered a noun here. Uh, and I'll devote, uh, he, as he went on to say about this subject, he said, I devote my first lecture to the opposition between lightness and weight and will uphold the values of lightness. This doesn't mean that I consider the virtues of weight any less compelling, but simply that I have more to say about lightness. And I would concur with Calvino, although uh, he was referring to literature and not architecture, um, but that I feel I have more to say about lightness. <laughs> so I'm gonna start by showing, um, as Robert mentioned, um, one of the early projects, when we started out in the practice, our first commissions were installations uh, like this for creative time on the Battery Park City landfill. So Battery Park City isn't even here. This is just the landfill when they excavated the World Trade Center, put the landfill out, added more land in the river. And there were a number of um, installations that were collaborative projects with artists, architects, um, and this one was called Freedom of Expression National Monument. Uh, it had a plaque on the ramp of, for it, which um, invited the public to step up and speak out. The piece was also later reinstalled for the uh, Republican National Convention when it was held in New York at uh, Foley Square in Lower Manhattan. So people would go up and they'd scream, you know, I hate my boss or different things, but um, and then there was uh, done also with a performance artist, John Malpede, who did a performance piece on this. So we began our practice, as I mentioned, designing installations, uh, designing exhibitions and lofts in lower Manhattan. So here, this is a detail from offices for New Line Cinema East uh, in New York. And I thought I'd show a few details from earlier projects uh, and then share some more recent projects to address um, the topics of uh, the sustainable and economical materials that I wanna touch on, um, site strategies for resiliency and the use of renewable energy sources and increased daylighting, new forms of workspace and how programs might reflect our contemporary culture and also adaptive reuse of buildings for new programs that conserve embodied resources for first future use. So this is Henry standing on the floor at New Line Cinema outside the conference room. Uh, so this project, um, an early house project for a couple in Manhattan, and we tried to make the columns as thin as possible. We were working with the uh, structural engineer, Guy Nordenson, and actually we, were, we wanted to make them out of titanium. They could have been even thinner, but um, it was over budget. But the idea was that the house was really like a suitcase that you would pick up and take with you. And they were really city dwellers and they were kind of fearful. This is on the Delaware River. You're looking at the Delaware River. Um, they were kind of fearful of being in the country. And so this vertical back window, which is actually a door when you specify it, they wouldn't let us call it a window because they were terrified that an ax murderer would come in to their house in the country and they, they felt much more safe in the city. But that's why the staircase, everything is kind of lifted off very light from the ground. Uh, and then uh, Robert also mentioned the Wall Street Ferry Terminal in Lower Manhattan. Right after and around 9-11, we were commissioned to do a ferry terminal um, right off of Wall Street. It's called the Wall Street Ferry Terminal and very, very small building. Um, and it's a little building like the house that's in this case, trying to be bigger than it is. Um, and this very large garage door is meant to kind of double the size of the interior. It's a very thin membrane. Uh, the whole building can be flooded and it did flood, flood actually in Sandy. And uh, on this site, many people were still able once the flooding disappeared to access lower Manhattan by ferry when the subways were closed down. 
And we thought of this pier really, um, we wanted to keep the building kind of clipped to one edge because there's no open space in lower Manhattan, as you probably know, very little. And we wanted to allow as much of it to be open and free for people to come in and have lunch, to change ferries, for events to happen at the end. So we kind of lock it on the northern edge and allow people to flow either through it or around it. Uh, here's a view of it looking down. And then as you approach it from the north, we took, you know, you're kind of coming at it from the ferry. So we're, we anamorphically projected uh, the text of Pier 11 where it sits on the north and roof of the building. We thought of that surface like an aircraft carrier where things kind of land and take off, which is what people are doing as they come into Manhattan. Uh, here's the door open on a nice day, uh, kind of semi-opened. And just a detail from a residence um, in Sagaponic, just to kind of talk about uh, the condition of inside and outside and, you know, kind of moving and thinking about interior programs moving out and moving back in. So, you know, you're looking at what is actually a door and an outdoor space that's kind of in between the, the real outdoors and this kind of interiority of the house. And the bathroom for that house that moves programs from inside to outside, like a shower and a cabinet that hangs on a kind of window um, with mirrors. So it creates this kind of um, ambiguity between the interior and the exterior. At the Corning Museum of Glass, um, we were charged with kind of using, well, creating an, an entry and new orientation center for the existing building that was built by Wallace Harrison in the 50s. Uh, this is a large model we built in our office, just studying the glass. We were very interested in how, just kind of that idea that I was showing you in the residence of moving from inside to outside and creating an ambiguity about that space, creating the kind of opening and kind of opening of a line and a breathing space between inside and outside. Uh, we wanted to reveal glass on edge and expose its materiality. So we worked really hard in this project to not have the black rubber on the edge of that glass, the sealant, and, and read the, the, the green of the glass as you enter. The structure moves from inside to outside. You move between two exteriors to get to an interior. Uh, and here's that space looking out into the landscape. And then a view from an upper level back down uh, into, the, into the landscape from uh, the lobby of the orientation center. On, on 53rd Street in Manhattan, uh, this is the, a project for a number of residences in Midtown in a, in a kind of infill block where we worked with a facade that was kind of bending and folding to take in a view down the street, which was of the Hudson River. We wanted people who are mid-block to be able to stand in their window, turn their head and be able to see the river. So that's what uh, instigated this, this fold of facade. And then the windows that pop out, which are allowing you know what you need for light and air, but also animate the facade uh, to kind of indicate you know the variety of individuals who are in there and what they might be doing. Here it is um, in its context. So back to Corning to talk about um, the glass and how the glass kind of sim signal different kind of programmatic, um, let's say anticipates programmatic events. This is a detail at the handrail outside of that upper level where the glass leans at seven degrees, which is the same angle it leans at at the facade. And it's leaning where people might lean to look out or to look down at space below. So it kind of shifts from 90 degrees to to seven degrees off of that 90. A view of the exterior and the exterior structure that moves to the, uh, to the outside at the um, arrival facade. And then to the south where um, there are places to gather and meet outside and we move to a different kind of system um, of curtain wall on the south end of the building to create this kind of transparency and allowing the landscape to kind of come up and around and up and under this um, roadway actually that we created for um, jitney buses to draw people off. Inside on that upper level is a digital theater 
uh, where the end of the theater is glass, and that's the space where we were looking back down into the lobby. Um, originally, what happened was we curate, the, the space was curated, a film was made, and at the end of it, the screen goes up and you're looking from the theater back down into the lobby. Well, this is an adaptive reuse example where we were asked by Corning, we've been working for them over a number of years, to turn this digital theater into a hot glass theater. So we had to bring, and this is this is the space as it sits, um, obviously kind of hung into the into the large space with um, eating facilities below, and there's that that walkway above. Another view of that digital theater. Um, but we turned that space, that same space, into this hot glass theater. We had to bring a furnace in. Um, and the demonstrations occur here. It's incredibly popular at Corning. It's really the thing people want to see, so they moved it up front. Uh, we did an entire operation on our interior facade, and we cut that, you see that bluish rectangle, that's a cut we cut into the side of the theater so that you could see out into the landscape from a space that was previously sealed off to bring um, daylight into that space. And uh, this is facing east. At The Ohio State University, uh, we worked on, uh, first project we worked on there was for the Wills um, Health Services building where we were adding on to a kind of brutalist um, precast building that you see in the behind. And it's really fun project here located just west of the oval behind the library. And the, that blue circle is where we created the entry, but there's a lot of Va of Vienne coming uh, through this space um, with the sports center off to the left um, and then um, obviously to the north um, a lot of student housing. So we were looking really carefully at the Wills building um, and how it was made of these precast panels and we wanted to create a dialogue with that building without mimicking it or copying it, but creating this new entryway. And then obviously there was a whole renovation that went inside the building. But we started to work on this precast and think about how we how we might bring the, the precast material to our new construct on the facade. And we studied, we were thinking, well, what would what could we do with precast today? How could we think about it differently? What are the ways in which kind of the tools we have that could enable us to, um, to work with the precast maybe here in the studio uh, to study it and then to propose um, something for the, for the exterior. So this view is actually, it's mirrored, but this is what you're seeing behind me. That's the same, that's the same window. And uh, instead of that model that's up there, this is a study wall where we were studying just by cutting with our $27 foam cutter um, different contours within those four inches that we could array along a number of panels um, to create this kind of soft curtain-like effect of the, of the precast. And these are just a number of studies that we made. Um, these are some of those pieces. And we wanted, of course, each end, we wanted to be able to flip them around so that they could always meet each other on the ends. And we could do with just a few number of panels um, a number of um, variations on that. Um, I should note that we worked with Prospectus Architecture um, Firm of um, Ohio um, on this project. These are some studies that were then sent to us of the precast. Everybody's seen that, we're all architects, we know how that works. It's very exciting though when you get a real piece of the building. Um, these are some of those profiles that we were studying and they had to always meet each other obviously so we could flip them around. And then this is a set, you know, one page of that construction document kind of looking at those profiles and, you know, to, to produce that effect of that kind of softness of shadow and light along those, those side facades which face east and west in the building. So there they are. Obviously they have to fit on the back of a flat truck, flatbed truck and they get hung on the side of the building as we all know. Uh, and there they are in all their glory. Um, and then this detail that we worked out, we think very carefully, I don't know, um, to hold that curtain up, just kind of lift it off the ground a little bit 
Uh, so you'd read that softness of the curve against a flat plane um, at the base of the, uh, of the building. And there it sits. So um, a second project in the West uh, Campus area um, at the Ohio State University was for the Veterinary Medical Center, which was an addition to, we kind of seemed to specialize in addition to 60s buildings. And this was a, a brick kind of box building, the veterinary school, maybe people know it. Um, we needed to add offices, a new entry. And uh, we, I wanted to show this because we were studying how to bring light. I mean, I think they felt we were just gonna add something onto the side, but we created a new entry at the, at the north, the north facade and at the foundation kind of lifting it up because we had kind of complicated sectional condition to relate to within the building. And then we created, um, I don't think my mouse works, but an inner courtyard to bring light into this bar on both the east and the west side, um, and then allow it to be a kind of con con contemplative garden space that one could look in from the inside of the building, from the waiting area um, of the building itself for both offices, faculty offices that um, and meeting rooms that exist in this bar. So if you remember back to the Max Min house, this bar is kind of elevated and lifted up, um, wanting to show a certain lightness um, in relationship to the ground. And the canopy, which we uh, created for, when people bring their dogs and cats, they wanna be under, under shelter when they're running them into, the, into this facility. Uh, and then we, we made a kind of canopy out of a polycarbonate that since it faced north, we wanted to bring light into the building. So we made that entire surface um, translucent and a detail of that where it meets the bar. And interior, um, we use the structure as almost a finished material. Uh, so this is one of the meeting rooms. And I just love the fact that you have this very large scale structure in this small space that becomes, you know, part of what informs the interior of that space. So we've worked on, um, we work on, we work on all kinds of crazy programs. Uh, we have two projects I want to show you for the General Services Administration, the GSA. Uh, federal projects at the northern border of Canada and New York State uh, that we were doing almost simultaneously. One on the left-hand side of the screen is at Messina, New York, uh, on the on on a river, and then uh, on the right is at Champlain. Both of these places are extremely cold. When they give you the weather when you're in New York State, they'll always say, and it's 34 degrees below zero in uh, Messina, New York. So it's, it's pretty brutal there in the winter. Um, but it's an interesting location because you come from Canada, you cross an island that's actually the Aquasasne Nation, and then you cross the river again because it forks there, and then you arrive at the station. So it's a, a, at, the, at the land port of entry. It's like an airport on the ground, essentially, a land port of entry. Uh, it's more straightforward in Champlain, but it's like a huge amount of... Macadam. This is the site of Champlain. Uh, this kind of shows you what we're dealing with. It's a number of buildings. It's an incredible amount of circulation of vehicles. And uh, we were pretty proud that at Messina, we were able to argue for a shorter length of road because the Aquasasne, they actually go back and forth across the border a lot and they um, do it daily and we wanted to shorten their path. So we were able to shorten that route for them. Uh, this is what we had at Messina. So you can see this is a typical port of entry and uh, dark, this is what you're greeted with when you're coming from Canada to the US, it's always in shadow. So you're greeted with a facade that's always in shadow. So we kind of took that on and thought, how could we bring light in that Wills canopy, the will, I mean, sorry, at the vet school, which was done, borrowed from this project, actually, how could we bring light onto a northern facade? And so what we created here was this slope piece is actually a skylight facing south that brings light onto a uh, channel glass facade and brings light down into interior spaces. So here's the a, a detailed drawing of that condition. 
and then this is that space on the right. So we also uh, created clearer stories between offices. So instead of blinders, you have glass and it meets the channel glass. So that's almost as if your vision, you're kind of opened up at the corners instead of being closed in. So each office opens up. I'll show some views of that. This is um, the, the kind of, well, it's not really information. I always thought, oh, we're going to do this, this lobby of an information space. If, actually, if you go in here, you're already in trouble. So you probably won't go in this space, but um, I mean, if you were with a bus of people, you might go in this space, but we were trying to bring as much daylight uh, for the quality of life in these spaces because it's, as I said, incredibly cold and brutal most of the year. And then it was very important that this visibility, that this vis you know visibility of, of as much as is possible is really is very important at these ports for um, the officers working there. So this is that uh, facade that's receiving the Northern light and that those reflections of the structure actually move throughout the day. So you're looking at channel glass, you're looking at light coming from the back through it uh, to the north so that you can get light on that facade. And then a band of window, which is obviously ballistic glazing, but those are where a lot of the offices are. Uh, we did a number of canopies. I'm gonna do a whole array on canopies here for you, but you can see how the light and the structure kind of move and syncopate acro across that uh, channel glass. Uh, this is one of those strip windows that kind of seals itself against the edge. And I wanted to show this detail because, um, you know, when you're doing these big projects, you're looking for design wherever you can. And actually you can do a lot of design in these projects. And we decided that we didn't want to have any curbs CURBS in this project, you know, because sometimes these these huge projects with a asphalt and driving and turning radiuses, you have these endless curbs everywhere, and we wanted to make it as flush as possible, both so that the water could move. We needed to move a tremendous amount of water and manage it over this large site, um, and also for snow moving, so that they could just move the snow snow around without, um, you know, hitting these curbs. And then finally because I think it looks a lot better. <laughs> so this is a detail um, of before, you know, of the, of the asphalt along the edge of the building. Here's one of those uh, spaces. This is a, a lab and you can see those kind of blinders that are actually glass uh, that, that is the um, office next to you. And then they have clear visibility through to the, um, where the booths are, where the, the crossings occur. And you're seeing the channel glass and the daylight, the natural daylight, which is really great in here for working. And that's this is that condition of that office I was referring to. So again, the structure, everything is um, is what it is. It's exposed. We think it's beautiful. And this is the canopy um, at Champlain. At Champlain, so we had two very large canopies to design. And at Champlain, we worked on a canopy that was uh, composed of really just steel plate. We thought, what if we could do the canopy of just one material, uh, one material that could work as a reflective surface, and it can actually, this, we, we've done a canopy, we've done several canopies. This is the canopy uh, for the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, North Carolina at the Outdoor Amphitheater, and uh, we borrowed something from our columns here, which are tapered for Champlain, and we're using, in this case, it's uh, corrugated fiberglass um, exposing the structure. And this is the stage where performances and music all happen underneath, uh, where there also is an outdoor cinema um, for outdoor events with, where we designed a little booth. But, but this canopy uh, is a reference point for our, our canopies. And you can see the same structure that we are employing here under these, um, the large canopies at the passage of the, um, at the booths. So those steel, the big steel columns are tapered um, so we can get a kind of lightness with them and a movement. We wanted to create a movement. So you felt a kind of movement as you're moving through here. Uh, we also uh, did a canopy for Continental Airlines in a whole program where we did a number of um, all of the things you come in contact with for the airlines. And this canopy was in LaGuardia Airport until 
very recently, actually, when the whole crazy business started happening over there with that design build crazy business. But um, this canopy was made of carbon fiber and Kevlar, uh, very, very thin, very, very light. Glass is being used in compression and tension here to hold it up. Just some drawings of that canopy. Um, but back to Champlain. So here we're supporting from below, obviously, instead of hanging. But we thought about a kind of origami, like very different than steel, obviously. But could we fold the steel? Could we think of the steel as a folded plate to get strength and section and also reflective surface? For they, they need to have a, like 100 foot candles at those booths because people need to really see what's going on, like looking into cars and all that even though it seems very friendly. Uh, so these are the drawings of that canopy, um, you know, showing kind of the profile of that, how we were trying to achieve a thinness, a real thinness at the edges, right? So that it appears almost paper-like at the edge, but that you then the depth is created obviously through uh, the welding of panels together. Um, working with, with Ova Arup on obviously where the stresses were on that steel on those shapes so that we could get a shape that would both kind of express this movement we wanted to express as you're moving through, um, but also a kind of lightness, light like a bird, right? Not like a feather, light like a bird. Um, here's the heavy steel uh, that's trying to be light, that, that is welded. And then it's coming here to the site. It came in sections. It gets assembled, obviously and welded. Um, now this is the canopy at Messina. So that so we did this second canopy at Messina uh, where we're doing this very light surface that is the other one was this kind of light gray. We're, we're getting a huge amount of, of light, reflective light off of that surface. And at the, an area that they call secondary where you really do not wanna go because if you go to secondary, they're gonna completely take your car apart. So you really never wanna go here. But at secondary, we did a canopy that had to, you know, be very large and be a space that, you know, people could walk around a car. We have uplighting coming from below in the asphalt um, to, to use this surface. So here is the canopy that I really love um, at Messina that is in a space you probably will never go because it's in secondary inspection. You don't want to go there. But um, we had a lot of fun with this so that we could create this clear space underneath. This is where you get away with murder, right? On these projects, this is where you can get away with murder. So creating this huge span, um, this, I love this, it's so exciting. So here's the section of that. So we have, you know, the rain gutter at the very edge, but it comes down to this very thin point. So you don't really realize obviously that there's this section in it that's giving it strength. And here are some of those pieces coming into really like I don't know how these people do this in, in winter there. It's just touching that steel has got to be brutal. So this is the construction. And here are those, uh, the canopies at, at, uh, at the booths and uh, the entry building at Messina with the polycarbonate above and the clear glazing below. So on the facade at Messina, the second uh, port of entry, you know, we're facing north and there was there's this huge issue about security, obviously. And we, yet at the same time, we wanted to bring daylight in. And I think for the most part, the people working there, the officers would have been perfectly happy to be in a, in a concrete box, but we had other ideas about that. So we put a second skin on the building of polycarbonate that hangs over the block and allows for a clear story above. And you can see how the ceiling is held back so that that light can come up and over. And the person standing there is standing against the concrete block on the upper floor so that they're safe. Same thing in the below where they're in an office, but we could bring light into both of those spaces um, through this technique. And again, this is Northern light. And so we want the light from these spaces, which are typically on all the time to light up the facade. We also slip something up and under this facade that I'll show you, here it is. So this is this facade under construction with um, the polycarbonate, which is a kind of bar, almost like a, a barcode. 
that goes from translucent to transparent along the facade. And then we slip underneath it uh, the letters United States, very large, made out of yellow, like the yellow of the yield sign, like on a stop sign, a yield sign. We use that material so it's very reflective, very bright, but it slips up and under the polycarbonate facade so that you could read it kind of under and beyond. And then you can see how the attachment is occurring with the polycarbonate, so it's attached from behind. Uh, here you can see the detail of that um, occurring, which is uh, in that lobby area. So obviously we, we love our structure and we like to expose it. Um, another um, thing where we got away with murder, we, um, we had this idea with the no curbs idea, where there are no curbs in this project because of the snow machine, remember? Snow, have to move snow, Messina, very cold. Uh, we wanted, because everything is, you know, highway language. So there's dotted lines and yellow and road designations, everything everywhere. So we thought we would just really go to town with the yellow and use the yellow as a signifier. In this case, as you move towards the buildings uh, where it was safe for people to walk. So the yellow became this whole field on the ground and then went up into the buildings to signify where you would go. So it was almost a, a kind of environmental signage without using words. So this is everywhere on the site where there's yellow. So from all of the bollards to the lanes, to areas where it's striped, to parking areas, to then folding up and being on surfaces in the building. It's a crazy drawing architects make, right? So here's the port. We're looking back towards uh, the Aquasasne, towards Canada, where you come across the bridge um, from the south looking north and all the yellow. Um, and so then the yellow, which we made as a striped field, and because we have no curbs, right? So in order to not have curbs, you know, the yellow takes care of that. So that's where you can walk and you're safe because this is all about vehicles moving around. So you have to kind of, there, there are not a lot of people moving around, but if you are walking, it's safe to walk there. And that's kind of the signal to walk into the building. And then you see the yellow beyond and you know that's where you can go into these spaces. So then yellow goes behind the, uh, the desk in the um, admin building. And then at, this, at the secondary, this is where the trucks go through on the western side. Um, so you also have the yellow for, for drivers who are going in to show papers for, for trucks that are bringing materials or goods over across the Canadian border. And, you know, we love our handrails. So this is one of my favorite handrails that kind of goes from an asphalt surface of a truck loading area to um, protection, you know, for individuals walking into this, uh, into these offices beyond. Another detail of going where the admin walks, say from parking up, so they know where they can walk and it's safe and not to be on the left where there are trucks and all kinds of things, but this kind of leaning um, handrail. This is a, a building for customs inspection officers that sit in there, just a lot of goods inside here. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this building. There's a yellow wall in there, so you know that's where you go. It also has on the left is concrete, which is actually a storage tank for the water suppression, sprinkler suppression system for the building, for the site that holds all the water within those two walls. You don't even know it's there, but it's in there. Um, and then, you know, obviously water runs off into retention areas and such, but um, you can kind of see how the overhangs are designed for the sun. This is facing south. Um, and then just spaces for um, kind of open work areas beyond. So it's just really a roof that folds over um, and is propped up off of this large um, tank wall that is a board form concrete. And the, this is the truss that, that props it up. So these are, the, these are two buildings, these two outbuildings that we designed at the port. The one on the left is especially fun, I think. You always have to have fun in architecture. I always tell my students, if you're not having fun, you know, there's something wrong. You always, you have to be having fun. So. Um, on the left is the uh, truck inspection building. Uh, it's an entire building devoted just to trucks passing through and being scanned. 
These are the two buildings. So this building here, it is under construction. It's really just a kind of angle plate that's supported and then propped like, like the customs building. Um, but it's just designed for a truck to drive in, be scanned and then drive out. So the GSA wanted to, they said, this is a prefab building. They're people who make these prefab truck inspection buildings and we're gonna bring one on your site. We're gonna put it down. And I, there was no way I, would, I wanted to have a prefab building on our site. And so we went about proving that we could build this for less money than their pre. There is no such thing as a prefab building. I have to look to Alex because Alex, everybody says, oh, we're just gonna get a prefab building. Well, they don't, they're not really sitting on shelves anywhere. We all know that. So this was our battle against prefab this building and we, we met the budget. We came in under what their prefab was gonna be. Um, so this building, this is how it works. It's just all designed to scan a truck. Um, so the scanning machine scans against the concrete wall. Above that, I mean, they were never gonna have any natural light in their prefab. Building. So we brought daylight in. We also brought daylight in on the left side of the building at where a person is at their height. Here's the building. There's a little, the yellow right there is a little box where the driver goes and sits while their truck is being scanned. So it's just, it's like a highly specific building, but also pretty simple. Um, there's the guy, the truck comes in. And then on that Eastern side, we were able to create this kind of condition of it almost floating because it's set into the ground and that's the eye level uh, within the building. So it can bring light in it at eye level. At the Northern facade, this is that facade where the letters are sliding up and behind the polycarbonate and the barcode of the alternating polycarbonate kind of clear and translucent across that facade. And then a strip window, which is, I'm giving you all the details because you guys know all this stuff is tricky, but that's ballistic glass on the left because that's the port director's office and he has to see everything and feel safe in there. So nobody else has a window like that unless we have ballistic glass. So those letters um, slide up and underneath. So a smaller little uh, infrastructural building for the Bronx in New York City is uh, for the emergency medical services uh, on Zarega Avenue. And you're looking down at it. This is it in the snow. And it's a building all about also about vehicles kind of moving through it, being clean, being serviced, you know, getting ready to shoot out almost like a fire station, but uh, people actually don't live in it. They'll stay for like a 24 hour shift or 18 hour shift. So they're not living like a fire station, but they're in there for long periods of time. And they're then all, all of a sudden, you know, they are called to go out into the field. So this was after 9-11 when previous to this, there would just be these EMS trucks would just sit in a neighborhood. So now they get they got a building, which is very exciting for the neighborhood. Um, and this is our little building in the Bronx. So these are all the, this is the circulation that has to go in and around this little building, um, which sits on a kind of funny little corner site that they had where there's also a community garden on the end that we wanted to preserve and be able to actually give them some water back. Uh, so this is a cross section of the building. We wanted to bring as much airflow, natural air through the building, kind of in, up and through the building. Also really aware of the sun angles. We had a green roof, which the fire department who runs EMS had absolutely no interest in a green roof, but they soon came to be really excited that they were the first EMS station or fire station with a green roof in New York City. So we kind of jumped up and down to get that on there with our landscape architect, Scape. So driving through, air moving through, and then, you know, sun angles in winter and summer and um, light, lots of natural light. So here is that equipment bay um, and the vehicle bay, all very rough and ready materials. You know, they're just banging stuff around in here. Uh, those rolling carts, which carry their equipment that they grab when they run down the stairs and then just shoot out to you know, a call. Here's looking from that equipment bay down into the um, the vehicle bay. And again, we were, you know, the structure to us is really beautiful. We exposed expose the scale of the structure on the interior against 
the polycarbonate, and then we have also glazing and um, operable windows. Exercise spaces for them, you know, very, very simple materials, but, um, you know, the materials we love <laughs> to expose. And on the roof, which we call the fifth facade, um, you know, because there's actually a very large residential tower, NYCHA tower, just to the south of it. So they look down on this and they're very proud of having this. We had a big open house, a big pot, like it was very fun when it opened, but they can look down and see a green roof rather than just a bunch of equipment or something that doesn't look so great. So um, we also wanted to pr provide water, as I mentioned, to the community garden. So it slopes to a cistern uh, to provide that on the southern edge. So here's the view in nicer weather from the roof of the NYCHA housing. Uh, on the roof, which we detailed really carefully, uh, we have hydronic hot water up there. We have sonar tubes. We have a handrail that slopes in. We're gonna do that on a project at OSU that I'm gonna show you, um, but it slopes in so that there's nothing worse than that handrail popping up around the edge. So we sloped it in you know, and detailed it, you know, just behind the, um, the gravel and the sedum. There's the hydronic hot water and the, the, the solar tubes are really fantastic. They bring so much light into the space there. I mean, you guys all know about them, but you know, I just think they're incredibly effective. And all this stuff I think looks beautiful. So this is that facade that faces the housing and also faces where mo the majority of the people who work there arrive. And then there's a cantilever they have a kind of barbecue out there. They, you know, they like to hang out and, and they, they've been really great about kind of upkeeping their site. They, you know, because they're there, they're kind of like working on the roof, keeping it clean, keeping all the parking and all the, the green that, that Kdorf provided for them around the building up and in good shape. So there's that handrail, the funny little building that's a leftover in the Bronx that's next door. It's just a detail of that facade. So, Lastly, um, I wanted to talk about a project we're working on right now at, at uh, the Ohio State University for the Energy Innovation and Advancement Center. It's located on the corner of Kenny and Lane. We're working with Moody Nolan. And I wanna give a shout out to uh, Brett Wilcox, to Rob Donaldson, to Sam Markham, who we're working with there that we've been working really hard with and um, getting through our CDs on. Um, so this is a building that really marks this new West Campus that's coming. A lot of soccer fields there right now. You probably, if you've been over there at all, you, there's this building on, behind on the left, which is a lab building that's under construction. And uh, this building is a incubator. It's really for technology incubation uh, for Ohio State University, and it's going to support research and development of uh, the next generation of smart energy systems, of renewable energy and green mobility. And it's gonna be designed really as a beacon of high performance uh, and energy efficient design kind of anchoring this new West Campus. So it's both focused on a kind of well-being um, uh, within the workplace. Uh, and also there's a, there's a whole charge about DC, which I'll talk about in the building here. But it goes beyond the focus of just well-being and its occupants by delivering high-performance building that really is meant to exemplify the future of smart energy design. So um, let me take you through it. So here's that corner and uh, master plan, just a little peak, little corner of a master plan on the corner, which we started with. There's a building coming on the left there. There's the IRF, which is under construction, which is the lab building. This is our chunk of our now about 60,000 square foot building, um, looking, we can actually see through through some of those, the, the, um, the stadium from here. So we have 20,000 square feet of solar canopy potentially on this roof with 60% of the building energy use. But in order to do that, uh, we have setbacks of course, but we have to have, we created solar setbacks from our neighbors. So we were working with these while they're in the design phase, certainly the one on the right, which is already in construction, and the one on the right, to, the left to come. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that they need to keep 
their shadow off of us so that we can produce the amount of energy that we want to, that we are hoping to provide here. Um, also, obviously, a fire setback. So a kind of indent where there's a, 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 a kind of service area to the side of Kenny. Um, and then this lower, so this is the yellow is obviously the piece underneath this large canopy that extends beyond the building. And then there's this wonderful little piazza space to the west, uh, which we want to shade more. We need to shade this out that side of the building. So we're using our solar canopy to do that as well. So there are those that what we're trying to achieve. We studied obviously the sun, you know, we all architects do this, but you know, we had this kind of exceptional charge where we had to keep that roof completely out of shadow. So the geometry of it is formed, you know, really from those setbacks um, and trying to, for it to grab as much energy as it possibly could through, through the photovoltaics displayed on the roof. Here's a study model uh, in our office that we made. Uh, we make everything here um, and we're studying. One of the things we were interested in here was both the overhang, but we're trying to actually over my left shoulder is a, a model of the roof at a larger scale, but you probably can't see if it's right there. But we are studying the structure that holds the photovoltaics because we want it to be very beautiful. We want it to be very light like a bird and we're holding it up so that you can walk underneath it and it can be also a didactic element in the building um, and provide shade. So, but we also wanna provide some light. We, we don't want it to be completely, completely solid because we want light to, to come through it. So we're holding them apart off. Usually they're just kind of a plane, a solid plane of photovoltaics. We, we hold them off of each other to get a kind of dappled light effect. Uh, this is a exploded axo of the building, uh, really just to say that there, it's, it's an interesting building in that nobody lives in this building permanently. Uh, people are going to come and go, they're going to take space, they're going to go somewhere else, they're going to in incubate ideas and work in here. There, there are, are workspaces that could expand and contract depending on what's going on in the building. And, uh, you know, people can move out into open spaces to take those over. So. Um, it has to be malleable, but it also has to provide a kind of interior focus and a really, let's say, really high quality of work so that you can get workspace, so that we can get a great quality of light on the inside, natural light. Here's that plan of the roof, which we love. You know, this is the kind of thing architects like to look at. Um, but we're spacing, uh, there's a really beautiful um, photovoltaic system in Arizona at ASU by D. Bartolo and Associates Architects. And we looked at that and we noticed how they were holding them apart to bring some light. And so we thought that was really smart. So we started working with that to create kind of a wharf and a woof here with the spacing. And uh, just think about it as something that, you know, provides this kind of dappling movement of life, like the light moved across the facade in Champlain, we want to do that here with this canopy on the facade of uh, the EAIC. So here we're studying, you know, what happens, um, what it might look like. You know, the overhang is obviously also providing shade. That's very important, specifically on the west facade, which is in the upper left corner here of the building. So we have polycarbonate and glazing. Uh, and then we have precast, there are three materials that we're employing. It's a very, what could I say? Inexpensive, not inexpensive. It's, it's a kind of competitively priced. What can I say? Here is us studying the um, facade. This is, again, we're going back to what we were doing on wilts, but we wanted to create a softer condition with the precast. Uh, so it, we, we really, kind of made those curves much shallower. And also because the building is much taller, we have like huge expanses of this in a vertical plane. And so we had to create a scale that was, you know, had a relationship with the body. This really funny model here sitting on our conference table where the paper is crushing itself <laughs> on the lower part. Um, we just made it out of paper, obviously, but we were trying to see what these different curves, the ones in the middle are, are too tight. We wanted this really shallow, soft curve um, because of the scale of the expanses of this 
precast and also how it might relate to the polycarbonate. We're very concerned about this. And this is the lower right are some samples of the actual material. This is probably a little bit too light. I think it has to be a little bit, we're going a little bit darker. And then these are the other upper right are uh, pieces we produced on our uh, 3D printer in the office, just studying those. And then we put them on our models. Little Santa's workshop here. So this is a section through that space. We have a at the plaza, the piazza, we called it on the left. It's at a different elevation than Lane, Kenny and Lane uh, coming around on the on the east. So Kenny Road. So you've got this ground floor space that has a kind of town hall cafe, you know, in meant to invite people in because they're providing the food and and a lot of very large meeting space for the other two buildings. And then as you move up to the building, it becomes more you know, focused on work, but they do, I think they'll be bringing people through, they'll be walking people through the building, um, through a whole sequence up um, to kind of show people, you know, the excitement of what we hope would be going on in here. We were very keen to bring light all the way through the building from north to south. So you can also see it all the way from north, north to south and to the north we see uh, the Waterman Farm, which is really great. So this is just cutting through that north-south section of the building. Batteries down below, testing pods, the cafe, and all of that. Uh, and then that big solar canopy. So these are some of the things that that canopy can do. Uh, it has uh, a DC microgrid that's directly connected to testing pods, which are some of those spaces inside. So they can work on DC power directly in the building. Uh, obviously creating a lot of renewable PV power in the building and then natural ventilation, daylight harvesting and using, um, you know, the DC microgrid for lighting and some mechanical. And then we have this future battery storage, which will happen uh, down in that space that you saw in the section. Here's um, a rendering when you have to show everybody what it's going to look like, right? So uh, very open exposed ceilings. We have to, when you do that, you obviously have to organize everything on the ceiling uh, and, you know, hang your BRF units, everything gets exposed, um, but it, but we think it can be very beautiful. We have a very large garage door like we have at the Ferry Building on Pier 11 that opens up to the West Piazza to just kind of spill out for events and on those kind of days in the spring and in the fall when we can actually have natural ventilation through the building. As you move through the building from north to south, at the north, from south to north end of the building is a large meeting room that has glazing all the way around with both polycarbonate and a curtain wall. Uh, but it is really to bring a lot of light in, but also we wanted to reflect the Waterman Farm in this kind of mural that's, it's an, there are a number of acoustical panels is what they are because we have an exposed ceiling, but to kind of reflect the green of Waterman Farm uh, out to the north. Uh, workspaces that can be opened or closed um, as you move up in the building. And then uh, the view from the piazza looking west with the stadium, if you're up on a cherry picker beyond. And hopefully you'll be able to see from those testing pods um, on the west plaza. So uh, then to close with, I wanted to show a project which we just finished I just finished with my students and Alex Mann, who's sitting here, who is a OSU graduate, works in our office, and I should say Jacqueline Stern from OSU also works here, um, which is for a pavilion for the graduate students, which I sat in this morning at uh, Columbia University, and we finished it on time, and it's an inflatable that we designed and built over a semester uh, in a seminar with 21 students and with help from Silman Structural Engineering. And it's, we had it designed, uh, well, we designed it and it was fabricated in Barcelona. And it's attaching into people's windows. The, the architecture studios are on your right and um, Fairweather Hall is on your left. It actually goes into one of the faculty's offices. It's kind of wild. So we made a platform. Here it is, we hoisted it on Tuesday. This just, this is, this is now back to my lightness point because um, we're building this inflatable that uh, we could do our virtual graduation under and then hopefully students can meet under and have fun and we can have, you know, open classrooms underneath. And then with the first night it opened up and it has lighting inside, we left, we left the lights on and these undergraduates just kind of occupied it. 
and started dancing and put a boom box there. And it, it was just so thrilling to see it used um, in a way that we really hoped people would just, you know, have a great time and be outside um, in this time that we've been living all inside. Um, so I sat under it this morning and we had our virtual graduation. Thank you. It's called Spot, Avery.Spot. If you wanna look it up, it has its own Instagram page. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. Lori, that, that, was, that was exceptional. Um, we, as architects, we should all aspire to take all our projects to the level that you finesse your work. It was, yeah. it's, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, we have a, a long list of questions and I don't know if we can get through a lot of them. Okay. But Kate, why don't we start with, uh, cause it's relevant to one of the later projects. Let's start with um, Jana Keller. May take a minute. Okay. I had said we can walk you around the office if we have no questions. I told Robert we could do that. Oh, um, hi. Uh, hi. This is, uh, um, I was just curious if the Energy and Advancement, Energy Innovation and Advancement Center at OSU was going net zero energy. I know that I noticed that there was a lot of energy efficiency, but I didn't know if like they had a goal of net zero energy. No, it's not going net zero. Um, it was decided that the work that's being done it, the research that's being done it, that's on DC power uh, was really what they wanted to focus on rather than actually making the building the demonstration of net zero. We, we are actually trying to get it, use as much solar as we can and draw it in the building. We tried, one of the goals we tried for, and we got very close and we might be able to, to actually achieve this in the future still, is to have it be an all DC building. And so we, we tried to put as much on the DC because they're doing DC research in the building. And uh, we got kind of tripped up when you have things like pieces of mechanical equipment that have warranties and no insurance company is going to, you know, insure them if you start taking them apart and switching them over to DC. So, um, but we think we could probably do that in the future. I mean, this is really the first um, building like this. Anyway, there are buildings like this that are just kind of server buildings but uh, buildings where entire rooms are devoted to DC and we're trying to kind of move it all to DC. So it's not net zero, but it's, um, it's working on the future of smart energy design. So that's, that's really where it's focused. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, Aaron Hill. Hi, Aaron. Bialowski? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hi. So I uh, was wondering what advice you might have for us with getting away with murder. <laughs> Convincing conservative clients such as the GSA to, you know, take what they may consider a risk in creating special design moments. Yeah. Well, I always, you know what you, what we always did is like, you do something over here, like you get their attention over here, you know, and then you're like, you're working, you're working over here on the design and they're over here, you know, they're thinking, it's just the curb was one example. So you just, to me, it's all about talking about the pragmatics because you have to do that. That's what we have to do. And so, you know, you saw those pragmatics, you can get away with murder because they're over here. They're like, you're like waving a flag over here and keeping their, in their attention over here on those pragmatics. And then you're over here, you know, doing your other stuff, doing your stuff over here. So I think it's, you know, and they, but they actually, there's some really great people at the GSA and I, you know, they, uh, you know, I think, I think we have to try, we have to try to get away with murder, you know, because that's what our job is, is to get away with murder, really. I mean, we have to push that um, because they wanted, they would just been perfectly happy in a concrete box. I'm not kidding. So, you know, the, but they can't visualize and we're, we are the people who can create visualizations and try to help them, you know, see what we could actually do and meet the budget. As long as you meet the budget, you know, don't you think that's a big part of it? Not going over budget? That's it. That's it. That's the golden rule. Not going over the budget. We came in, uh, Sean Gallagher, who worked with us and worked with me on uh, the Messina uh, he always likes to say we were $4 million under budget and we came 
finished early. And it's true. So I like pat myself on the back, right? <laughs> but that's how you get away with murder. I think. I mean, you can't always get away with murder, obviously, but you try wherever you can. Come on, Erin, you're from Florida. You can figure out how to do that little shuffle. <laughs> well, it's not, I mean, come on. We know it's hard. We know it's really hard. It's a slog, but you know, you look for those moments. I remember when I was a student at Cooper Union and Frank Gehry came to talk to us and he wasn't like the Frank Gehry is now, but he was, you know, he was a pretty interesting guy. And he said, if you can get a garage to design by some, if you can get a garage for your friend, you can design a garage for your friend, you're gonna to try to get away with murder. You're gonna to try to do something with that garage, right? That they didn't really think they were gonna get. But then it's gonna be, you know, I think, you know, you just try to make a move. I always say you get one move too. You get one big move, you know, like the letters, that was our big move, which is a whole other story, but anyway. The letters are great. Uh, okay, let's go to John Isich. Mm -hmm. John. Hi, Lori. Thanks for sharing your work. Mm -hmm. um, it appears you had an early extent and extensive relationship with Corning Glass. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's obvious that you use a lot of glass in your projects. I was just wondering, uh, was there an inspirational or educational role that experience played in the development of your work? Well, we got that project. We were a very small office. You know, we always said it was so exciting when we did a footing. When we got to do a footing, actually when we did the ferry building, there was no footing. So we were just like, couldn't wait to do a footing. You know, we never got to do. So we, Corning, we got, we, we were actually brought in um, because we'd done the ferry building and some canopies. And then um, we were brought in to design an exhibition for Lubinsky Bricktova, who are glass artists. And we designed an exhibition and renovated the space. And after we did that, they gave us the project for the addition. Um, and so it kind of came out of a relationship where it was a small project. It's like, I always tell my students, you get your foot in the door and you don't let that door shut. you like, you keep your foot in the door, right? You got to keep the, you like get away with murder. You got to keep your foot in the door. So you, you know, we, we, we were lucky in that there was a guy there that, you know, hired us to do this job. It was very exciting. And then um, then we just, you know, it wasn't like we were thinking we were glass people, but, um, you know, we, were, we thought about, because glass, I realized the first time I went to Corning and I was driving, you get a little plane, you get on the highway, you get off. And then I kept thinking, I was wondering, where is the glass? I kept thinking, when am I going to see glass? I had this expectation. I'd never been there about where is the glass. So that was part of the inspiration for that green edge that you meet on edge. Instead of walking through a storefront, we would see it on edge and it would expose itself. So that was that trying to fulfill that um, desire that I had the first time I got there because I kept, I had this expectation about glass. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Thank you, yeah. Okay, let's let's go to Dave Robar. Okay. Cleveland. Oh, hey, greetings. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Lori, for all of this. Um, really beautiful work. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of rephrase a question I put in earlier in the middle of your talk mm -hmm. about the kind of service buildings and so forth. And what do, where do you see... Uh, you know, with a hopeful increase in federal infrastructure spending, does that mean more, uh, better design for more of the masses? Can can you and other folks that are doing this work, uh, do you see like more of that coming down the, the pipe? And do you have any shovel ready projects along those ways and along that line? Shovel ready, I don't, I mean, we just got an IDIQ with the GSA. Um, you got to watch for those, by the way because we missed the last one. We've been, we kicked ourselves for five years. It just flew by, you know, you, these things come on your screen and then you're just like, oh, what was that? So um, I think I don't have any particular insight, but I think things are a lot better with a new administration, if I may say so. And an administration that doesn't want people to have just classical architecture 
and I think there's a lot of infrastructure that has to get built. And some of it's, there are going to be opportunities in that. Um, you're going to find opportunities in that for architecture. And I think that um, the design excellence programs are the programs that they at least use those words. And so they acknowledge with those words that they'll spend a little bit more on architecture. That's the good thing about that. Um, the city of New York, the Department of Design and Construction, where we've done a number of projects. I don't think, I, oh, no, the, well, the ferry building is kind of like one of those projects or the Zurega, the, the uh, EMS station. They formed after the one in, in um, Washington that in, um, at the GSA that was started, uh, the DDC kind of copied them and have, they now have a design excellence program. So those programs, you know, they'll at least acknowledge you know, that they're gonna spend like a few percentage points more for architecture. So you can, you have a little leg to stand on. And I mean, we're, I, I think you, those are, I mean, I just think it's so great to be able to give back to the world and give back to these, you know, find moments where you can do something with architecture, even if it's a handrail, you know, that somebody touches, or as I said, the ground where you can remove a curb, you know, all that stuff matters. and you know, working in the city here on this design commission, you, know, you can't believe the stuff we look at. And, you know, you can make a difference, I think, in all kinds of ways, you know, comfort stations, all that stuff. It's around for a long time. And I think we're right. way behind Europe on all this, um, on these kind of infrastructural buildings. And we need to, I mean, I just think we all, you know, architects, AI, you know, we need to just elevate it all. Because that's the stuff that we have, we're gonna live with for a long time. Exactly. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Along a similar line to that question, uh, Mike Mock has a question similar to that. Okay. Oh, hi, Lori. Um, I really liked your presentation. And um, I, I was wondering, though, how, what's the pitch like to your, uh, your office uh, team, teammates there on the uh, uh, how how you're going to approach a, a design a building that ha houses uh, uh, the function of X-raying a, a truck that you know you're searching for contraband or something like that on? You mean, do the people in the office here? Yeah, how, yeah. How do you you know? How do you oh, get you them excited about want, that? You think they wouldn't want to work on that? <laughs> well, I think most should, most people. We've got another project I won't even tell you about. Yeah, um, I, I think I think like you said, you you, got, uh, you know most people would think of it as a prefabricated solution. You, you obviously well, you well people who aren't architects they i mean you guys i know you guys all have the same problem they're like oh we're just gonna get a prefab building first of all it's not cheaper i i did a whole seminar I, we did this publication at the pdc where they were trying to put prefab in and we kept finding out that it's more expensive mm -hmm. unless you you know i mean that's a whole other thing you guys you know we can all dig into but um you know, these, they're not sitting on a shelf. They're like sizing the members, you know? So it's, I think if you're, if you're, sm I mean, they, they're smart. We didn't have the lighting and everything. They didn't, they get daylight in there. There's all this stuff they got for free, right? Mm -hmm. And we could think about, um, you know, just a big door and how wonderful that, all the elements that they have, we just can put together in a different way. You know, I mean, we have to think about it maybe that's the cost of doing business, right? We have to think about it, that costs money. But I, I don't know, I like, I would love to do a parking garage. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I would love to do, we have this, I'm gonna diverge for a second. I think I can do this. Um, in the city here, we have this whole, they're closing Rikers. People may have heard of that. There's this island here called Rikers. They're gonna close it, de Blasio wants to do it. They're gonna take all the jails and they're gonna put them in all the boroughs. The first project they're building is a parking garage in Queens. And this is, I see it before the Public Design Commission. The thing that's killing me about it is that they won't make it a flat plate building. They want to do it sloped. It's a building with for 700 cars. I hope nobody from there are listening. And they're gonna make the whole building sloped. So that building can never be, and talk about adaptive reuse, it can never be anything but a parking garage. So that just kills me. And I've been fighting like hell to, make that a flat plate building. Um, and I think a parking garage can be super interesting. We've seen buildings that have been done in Miami. We've seen, I mean, Enrique Norton did a beautiful building at Princeton. I mean, just the screen, you know, there's all kinds of, it's a building that you don't have to think about 
heating that much, right? I mean, maybe in Ohio you need in the in the stairwells, but um, so I think you know we you know to think about how how these buildings can have sometimes they might end up with another life. You know, I mean, our port buildings, like what if everything becomes virtual, and our port building could become I don't know, a gallery or something. I mean, I don't know. I kept thinking maybe this thing becomes something else someday. I don't know. So I think these buildings um, will have other lives. And so I think we have to just think really carefully about them. And I think that, um, anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Thank you. I don't think I did. <laughs> Lori, we'll take one more question. Um, but before we do, I just want to remind everybody um, in the chat, there's a link to sign in for your HSW credits. Yeah, and I hit all the points, by the way. <laughs> earning points, I got them right here. Don't forget to sign in. You get 1.5 hours. And uh, also a little plug for next month's lecture will be Monica Chada, who's from Civic Projects Architecture out of Chicago. And that'll be on Thursday, May 27th. So our final uh, question will come from Terry Welker. Hi, Terry. Hi there. Nice Hi. to meet you. Um, I was really excited about your um, introduction. Uh, maybe I'm old school or something, but when someone references Italo Cavino, I'm like, <laughs> all right, this is a good start. Um, and but so, then I left it, right? <laughs> then I just took a left turn. Yeah, well, the, uh, you know, the, of course, one of my, you know, I'm sure one of your favorite books probably is uh, Invisible Cities, you know, mm -hmm. um, where he merges poetry and prose quite well. But I was just curious about in your design process, I mean, you mentioned one word, lightness, but I'm just curious in that when you're having these design discussions in your studio, do you introduce other words to kind of ha help extrapolate that? Things like edges, translucence, or transparency, or other things like that, just to keep people focused on uh, the form? I think we make up funny names for things um, sometimes, you know, funny names for pieces that look like a shoe or you know, it looks like a tennis shoe or I don't know. I mean, you try to find analogies, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's that late. And I think we're, you know, I just always think if we can make something as kind of economical in a way, you know, like an economy of means, I think is something that I like to think about and strive for this, that idea that, um, you know, where Calvino said, I simply have more to say about lightness than, than <laughs> I feel that sympathy that I feel simpatico about that. I have more to say about lightness. But that's just the economy of means um, and um, not to use more than you really need uh, in terms of structure. And, and engineers are always trying to like overstructure things, right? So you're constantly trying to, you know, reel them back a little bit, but then, you know, than just the beauty of it because there I think it's so so beautiful if you allow it to be and it has a scale that refers to something outside of the body and um, you know I think really gives um, space um, kind of definition right definition stops the eye and all of that but I think I don't know I think we do we just usually make funny names up for things I think when we're like the walking man this model behind me is for the LA Arts Park. It was a competition. And the, there was a w elevated walkway that had these kind of funny legs like we used at North Carolina. And then we used them to support the canopies at Champlain. And I think Henry got the idea that it was like, there's this creature in Star Wars. Oh, ATST right. that walks. He has those really long kind of mechanical legs and it walks. And so that was what we were thinking and we were trying to get that kind of a feeling for those columns like this walking column like that 18. Yeah. It reminded me of Giacometti. Oh Giacometti oh that's nice Carve. those are nice yeah kind of carving yeah 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 beautiful that's absolutely beautiful and I just love yeah. the I mean the same to me that you know when these long forms end up in these little tiny edges that just makes them feel light yeah well the edges the, it's always so important, you know, turning a corner. I think architects, we, you know, we can see around corners like other people can, cannot, you know, we, we, we understand, you know, what happens on the other side of something. And so 
you know, we, we just kind of see the world differently, basically. Well, and it takes on a new a kind of ethereal character, I believe. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Well, thank you. Well, it's been fun to- Thank you, Terry. Laurie, thank you again. Um, very much appreciated and thank you. the work is beautiful. Next time we'll give you a tour of the office, you know. <laughs> There's Sarah, she's down there still working. Alex said I couldn't do this, but I'm going to do this. There's Alex, man. And then that is the other end. Can they see the other end? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's my bike. But down at the end is the, that's 80 feet long. That's the, that's Canal Street. So we're sitting here on Canal Street. You don't hear the trucks, but we're up on the fourth floor. So anyway. Thanks again. Hello from Canal. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Robert and Kate and Karen. Thank you.